those of you who haven't seen me or met me before, uh, I'm Peter Wood and I've been invited to make this film for you um, and do this painting of a rather lovely scene in Provence. In fact, this is a little seaside village called La Prelette and in the middle of this village or small town is a courtyard, a little house with a courtyard and in that courtyard there's this lovely scene I'll show you now amongst uh, all the shrubs and the herbs and the flowers there's a little old teapot stuck in a corner and what a delightful little scene so what we're going to try and do is show you how we can get the effect of this Mediterranean sunlight coming down through the leaves and the flowers and cascading across those surfaces onto the teapot but rather than throw you in at the deep end I thought it would be nice to show you how we could actually draw the teapot and do ellipses by showing you a way of drawing the teacup and doing ellipses and even the flowers how that simple flower shapes can be made by using ellipses and turning those ellipses on their sides or straight on and putting the flower petals within those to keep them even and to get them the right angles so we'll, we'll have a look at doing ellipses we'll have a look at how we can get the perspective of these things so that we can draw this whole scene out for you and the teapot and the way that I'll go about scaling this within the paper and then I'll take you into the painting itself and for the painting we're going to use the SAA paints, the watercolours which I've recommended for many years because so many people say to me oh we can't afford artist watercolours, they're too expensive wrong, in fact the SAA ones are artist quality and they are affordable and the difference is that they are much more refined than cheaper paints. So a cheaper watercolour isn't a saving, it's actually you're using more of it and getting not such a good effect because the better paints, the quality paints, like the artist watercolours, go further, they're more transparent, they're finer, so you'll get much more use out of them and a much more beautiful effect. I've chosen uh, a series of colours I'm going to put up here on the screen for you and instead of using Orioni yellow, which I actually prefer, I'm going to use lemon yellow today because uh, I've got an effect that I want to do with lemon yellow with it being slightly more opaque than the transparent Orioli yellow. Well, I haven't set up my paints yet, but here's the drawing ready to paint. Here's the drawing already done. But let's see how we got to that process, let's see how we got to this stage with the drawing as it is. So we've got a fairly carefully drawn teapot here and just working out where the shapes of the colours are going to go lightly and I've worked out where all the flower and leaf shapes are going in the backgrounds on the surface ready for my masking fluid to go on. But before we even get to this stage, how do we start off? First of all let's look at scale. We have a piece of paper here and the photograph on it, if I bring a diagonal from that corner through this corner and where it finishes would actually be the same scale as this rectangle. So through here, through here, where it meets there would be where it would finish. I've stretched it up a little bit and what I've done is, and I do this with canvases in the same way, I've marked it into quarters. Halfway, halfway, halfway again, so halfway, quarter, quarter, halfway, quarter, quarter, the same here and halfway quarter quarter and I've marked my photograph in the same way so I know where things are coming and then I've scaled that so I want to know where for instance this point comes and I've made a little X there and I'll show you this in the photograph now as you see the drawing in its early stages and you can see the little X in there and where the points are as I'm marking where the salient most important features come in the composition so I've marked out where the important things are coming. I want to concentrate on the, on the teapot, so I've started at the teapot. And how do we draw a teapot like this? How do we get the shapes right? Well, rather than just try and draw a teapot straight on, or a bottle even, rather than just go straight into drawing the teapot, we need to work out the proportions. So I've worked out where that comes according to the quarters and eighths. Where this point comes, where that point comes, where that point comes, and I mark as you can see on, the, on this photograph, I mark the most important points in space where they come in this grid, if you like, on the quarters. Once I know where those points are, then we need to know the angles of the perspective. If it's got more than one vanishing point, this cup and saucer have a vanishing point going this way and this way. In other words, it goes narrower that way and goes narrower that way. Here we see the cup and saucer, and here's the drawing I've done from it. Now what we do is, we have a centre line down through the middle, and then we have these angles going across so we know where things are coming and we want almost every quarter to be uh, to be reflecting so that quarter will reflect this quarter this quarter will reflect this quarter 
Let's just show this in a more simplified way. I'll show you it doing a simple bottle and where things go wrong. I deliberately show where things go wrong and how to make a bottle and draw it simply and the same with the church spire. Then we'll come back to this one. So I'll turn this paper over. Let's just try and draw a bottle in here badly. In other words, we'll draw it straight off without any construction lines at all. This will give you a much better idea of what I'm talking about. If I try and draw a bottle, the chances are that I'll make a mistake like this and one side will be different to the other. That isn't correct, one side to the other. If I try and make more mistakes, if I put the top on here and I put a point each side of that ellipse, then this ellipse here. Now those are completely wrong. doesn't look right at all, does it? Let's see how we can do it correctly now. Make a centre line first, very light line down. Check where your base is coming here. Make sure that side is equal to this side. The same with the top here. Make this side the same as this side. And then, because you've got two halves the same, you should be able to measure each time. We can come down equally. So if, if that's the width there, then we can make those measurements the same. Just have construction lines, light construction lines, and you can't go wrong if the, if, the, if the measurements are right, get those measurements the same. All we've got to do is come out to those marks and make sure that each side is the same as the other. Sketch that down to there. Now, when we come to doing, you see that's not perfect, but it's, it's much better than this one over this side. It's fairly equal. Now, when we come to doing ellipses, don't try and just draw one side. Try and imagine the whole ellipse here. So we do the whole of that ellipse and then come back to this side and bring it right round from that corner. So, then you can rub that bit out afterwards. Possibly you can even see it through the bottle slightly. And it's the same up here. Now, as the ellipse comes up to eye level, which our eye level is about here, if we cut that bottle off, it will be flat there, and then it starts to go upwards. If we're looking down on the bottle, and the eye level is up here somewhere, then this one would be slightly narrower. Now, an ellipse is never pointed. An ellipse never does this. It's always a slight curve. Remember that. So here we are, then we've got our... If we're going to do a whole ellipse here, we can come around that bottle there, look like that. And as it comes down, the further down we come and cut the bottle in half, the wider these ellipses become until they actually become looking down at a circle. I think you understand that now. So how do we take this further? Let's say we're going to do a church spire. Then we can have the centre line. It works in the same way. This is a little trick I'm just giving you, a little tip I'm giving you now. Church spire. And when you come to do the spire, keep it equal both sides. Have that centre line. And then you know where things are going to come on here. There's our perspective looking up at the, at the spire. The tower can be coming off and going further here. Coming down towards us as it comes out in perspective. But have this centre line coming down so that you're working down through the middle of the spire. And then come down, it comes to the same level here. Now we're coming, we're looking this way now. Because our eye level is about here. So things come towards us or things go above us. So a centre line for a spire or a building like that as well. It's the same thing as doing the bottle. We can keep things equal each side. Now I can just take these lines if I've got that line there. I can find the vanishing point which is over here. It's there, look. I can take that centre line to here. And anything else goes to there. And the windows and so on will go there using these, the centre lines of this. So a little trick then on drawing the bottles. Now we want to take this same method when we're doing those cups and this teapot. So here we can see the whole thing. I think we see the cup on one side and the drawing here. Uh, I've actually drawn this not from the photograph but from the cup sitting on the table. So if we then look at that same perspective going, the vanishing points going across here and away there and across here and away there, that's those lines if we were to extend those out. 
and then I've got a centre line going down through the middle of the cup and the saucer and I've worked out where my lines are going for the centre line of the, of the saucer here and the centre line of the cup. There's my cross for the cup so I know that this ellipse, once I've measured the, the thicknesses, these have to be the same here and have to be the same here. That's the same as that, that's the same as that. And it's not a point at the corner. And as we look further down, the ellipse becomes rounder. So this is slightly smaller up here. And as you come down the tube, it gets wider as you look down onto something. And that's what's going to happen with this teapot a little bit, because here we've got we're more level at the teapot here. But as we look down the teapot, it comes slightly rounder here. There's my centre line down through the teapot, centre line down here. And then the line going across the middle of the teapot lid, finding where the level of the spout is and the handle, marking out where things come, getting that curve right and the width right here, then the same curve here goes behind the plants and flowers here. So this is done then by the cross method and getting the ellipse the same here as here, the same here as here, and the same round here. We're just taking that down in a fraction wider. And then we just work out where the handle and the, and the spout come and so on and get those measurements worked out according to the quarters and eighths on your photograph. Quarter, that's halfway there. Now this one comes down about a third of the way into this one. So the third of the way in and that's where that edge of that comes. So I'm just using these marks to scale this teapot up and get all the salient features. Okay. So I've just marked out the most important things that I want on there and then we're ready to paint into that. You can see here where I've done the flowers, if we're talking about these flowers here, it's much easier to draw an ellipse, the shape of that flower, or a circle if you're straight onto it, a circle straight onto it, or an ellipse if it's at an angle, like that one there, like this one here, or flatter still, that one. And then we can find the centre of that and bring out the petals, one, two, three, four, five. If we just try and draw that straight off without the ellipse, you'll find you'll get the petals all over the place and get into a right mess. So drawing a very light line of your shape of your flower first to work within, I think you'll find will be quite helpful. So there we are. I hope I've given you enough tips now to have a go at the drawing. We can take it off now. It's low tap masking tape. And I, we're ready to go ahead with the painting. So I'm going to set up the paints next and show you the paints we're going to use. The colours, how they will mix together and also this difference between the ultramarines with the granulating and non-granulating paint. Well, we've looked at the paper we're going to use, and you've seen I've stretched it, simply by putting it in under a tap, wetting it both sides, and using gum strip to then tape it down and allow it to dry. But here's the amount of brushes that I keep for watercolour. Obviously, I've duplicated many here because I did have sets for France and sets for England. But uh, I use far more brushes when I'm using watercolour than I do when I'm using acrylics. I need some very simple brushes for acrylics, whereas I use more textural ones for watercolours. But what we're going to need today are these brushes here. Now I've got a number eight round, I've got a number three smaller uh, round pointed, and another four. Um, I may not even need all of those, but that's plenty for me anyway. I've also got a large oval mop, I'm using a Pro Art mop, which I, I really love. And I've got these clay shapers here as well. Now clay shapers are made of rubber and they're actually made for modelling. You can see by this one um, that I've got a rubber tip. We can use that for masking fluid. It's very useful for applying masking fluid. So these are three, sorry, these are three clay shapers and I've also got an SAA masking brush here. This brush is especially made for cleaning the masking fluid off the nylon afterwards. See there, the SAA masking brush. My tubes of paint have all arrived now and I've got the two ultramarines here, the granulating one and the non-granulating one and the rest of the colours. I'm going to set those colours out onto this sheet so you can see them more clearly in use with paper thicker and thinner. I have also a bottle of masking fluid and this is the SAA blue masking fluid. I like the blue better because you can see what you've done. If you use white on paper you can't see where it's gone.
Right, now what I want to do is go on to the non-granulating, uh, ultramarine blue and the granulating, and see if we can get the effect of those coming down the texture of the paper here. So we'll start with the non-granulating. It should be a nice, flat, smooth, beautiful, rich blue. We've got two ways of making the colour stronger, to add more pigment or to go over a colour once it's dried out. And of course if we make the paint thinner, as I'm doing now, then we will get a, a lighter colour a wash as well. So just graduate that down. Now that's non-granulating, and even that's picking up the texture slightly. Now let's see if the granulating really works. Start with a lovely strong, I prefer the, gra the granulating personally. Here we go then. Lovely ultramarine blue, and I think it's a nicer, slightly nicer blue actually. And this should, even on this paper, it should granulate slightly. We should get a lovely texture going in just a moment. Let's really get it uh, plastered on there. Then we'll graduate it down. This is called a graduated wash, a variegated wash. is one where it changes colour as it comes down. And we should be able to see this, especially on a, a heavier paper, it, it will granulate, it will form little textures. And you can just see it happening now into the texture of the paper. A little bit there, but not as well as it is here on the um, watercolour paper. So, so not paper, so it's not very textured. If it was more textured, we'd get even more of it. So let's just see what happens when we graduate it down a little bit and then let it slide down the paper a bit. We should get a more granu granulated texture here, which we're getting now. We'll just come back, look at the whole set of colours. If we use those same colours here again now to show the differences between them, this is our granulating, or it should be, ultramarine. So we'll do so on a, a heavier paper really. You can see it there now, just starting to granulate. Now let's go back to the non-granulating. And it's a smoother, only slightly, but it is a smoother finish. It's not texturing into that paper as much. There we go, you can see the differences between the colours. So those are all the colours we're going to be using, although we won't be using the non-granulating one. I will be just using the, the deeper, richer, straight ultramarine. Now let's just look at some of the colour mixes we can get with these, for the darks especially. We'll take a little bit of the deep purple and a wee bit of the green. Give ourselves a very dark purple green. So that's the purple and the green. If we take the purple and the ultra and the Prussian blue, we'll get a lovely rich, rich deep purple blue. If I want to go darker still, and I add some um, indigo to that, then we go almost down to a black. If I put some turquoise with that, 
so we can see the lovely darks we can get. If I take some of the Elizabethan Crimson and put that with the Ultramarine, I get a lovely deep ready purple. And I shouldn't need magenta for this because I've got the Elizabethan Crimson and it's going to go close enough I think. So that should give us a full palette for this painting and we'll make a start once we've got the masking fluid done. The next thing to do will be the, the masking fluid. We have to put this over all of the areas we want to leave highlights of white on. There are two more colours I'd like to explore which they've got that I quite fancy. I haven't used these for many years and some of these colours are new ones to me. So I'm going to put two more colours here. Those two colours are Quinacridge and Magenta, which is, looks to be a lovely new colour that they brought out, and Orion and Yellow. I mentioned Orion and Yellow earlier when talking about the Lemon Yellow, because Lemon Yellow is slightly opaque and we can bring it across these colours. Uh, Orion and Yellow is much more transparent and for glazes and washes very, very useful, a much, much lighter, brighter colour. So I'll put some of that in the Magenta down here and we'll see how they look and then we'll compare the um, lemon yellow and the opacity to the aureolin by painting them over some of these colours just seeing how they work, okay? Now there are two more colours I'd like to show you. We've got the lemon yellow here and I spoke earlier about using uh, aureolin yellow which is a much more transparent yellow. You can see here, very transparent colour. Go out the way down there and just take it down. Take some heavier colour from it. Try to draw that in and look it's a beautiful, it's, it, in this case, in the SAA colour, it's slightly stronger than many, many uh, Orioni yellows. Winsor Newton is, 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 a, is a bit lighter than this one. And I think it's a nicer colour really than the lemon yellow because it is transparent and with the Winsor Newton certainly it's the same uh, sort of hue as the, as the lemon yellow here. It's, it's cooler. This is slightly warmer. This is almost like a chrome actually. But anyway, lovely colour to use. What I want to show you though is the fact that it's transparent. I'm going to go across here and I'm going to take some lemon yellow, which is the should be the less transparent and more opaque one. I'm going to try and paint some of that lemon yellow across the blue. Let's see what happens. You can see it actually painted a little bit thicker as well. It will actually go across the blue to a degree because it's more opaque. So you can make sort of green with it. Thicker still. There you can see that's actually covering that blue a little bit, isn't it? If I take the Oriolan yellow, then it should be much more transparent. You can see it's just about vanished over that blue there, look. So it's a very different yellow to this one, and it's more transparent. So if you want a lovely transparent light yellow, then that's a very good one to use. I wanted more lemon yellow, which is that one, and I don't, didn't mind the opaque qualities of it in this particular painting. Moving from there, I spoke about magenta, which you haven't got here. The nearest, of course, is alizarin crimson, and I now have a beautiful magenta here, which is again from the SAA range. And it's quinquadrone magenta, so it's a lovely pink, beautiful pink colour. Bring that down, just thin it down. We've got a graduated, not a variegated wash, a little bit stronger at the top. But it's fairly transparent. And look at that lovely colour that we get as compared to the colours here, which are much warmer. And that's what we've used in the teapot. We haven't used this much cooler one, but we could do, couldn't we? It's a lovely colour to use. And it's a lovely colour to mix with as well. If I take some of that and mix that with the orange yellow, we get a lovely orange. We get a bit stronger. It's a much stronger mix of the quinquadrome. It can be a beautiful red-orange mix and go right down so it's much more yellow if I want to. You see the mixes we can get. Let's try that oil and yellow with the um, turquoise. Let's see what we get with that. I should get a lovely green with that. 
and there look at that beautiful green we get with that and the more turquoise we put in obviously the more bluer the cooler it will go and if I put in some ultramarine with that it will go to a much much deeper blue green more ultramarine more blue green with a warmer green we can add some of the quinquadrone to that and we start to get a much warmer orangey green interesting isn't it what we can get with those few colours but just for the moment I'm going to go back across to the ultramarines and I'm going to use some Windsor & Newton artist quality uh, just to compare and see how this works compared to the um, professional quality SAA ones. See if we get any more granulation or whether it's just the same. So far so good, looks just the same. What I'm interested to see is if we get more granulation because this um, SAA one is supposed to be a granulated one and I don't think it's as granulated as the Winsor & Newton was meant for memory but let's just see here what happens bring some more of that down, make it even stronger at the top here really bring it down there and then just glaze it on in blend it on in here interesting isn't that So we do have a small amount of granulation happening, possibly slightly more, just a little bit more with the Unzo Newton. What do you think? Not bad. I mean, as I was saying, I do think that the quality of the SEA for the price is very, very good. Uh, and these colours have all gone on transparently. They're all nice and strong. And we'll try these two new colours as well. This is just for your interest so you can compare. Well the drawing is ready enough now for us to start on the masking fluid so I'm going to take some of this blue um, SA masking fluid. I prefer the blue as I say because I can see what I'm doing on the white paper. And you can see the various shapes of tools I've got here for applying that. A brush, special brush from the SAA masking brush, a um, little wedge shaped uh, clay shaper, a, a pointed angular one and a, and a round pointed one. So between those I should be able to make all of the marks that are about this, um, these, these flowers here. Having said that, that's what we're going to be doing. So we've got to look at all of these petal shapes and also these long lines. I'm going to do the longer thin lines first and the detailed areas first and then come back to the larger leaves afterwards. Best to shake up the fluid first just in case it's settled a bit. So let's see what these various tools will do. I want to start off with um, this long thin line down here. I'm going to try my little angle tool here, see how that goes. It's fairly thin this masking fluid, it's not um, too heavy. And you can see it works quite well. I can use the blade of this tool to go down there, cutting it almost like a knife. And if it's a broken line, of course, you make sure it's a broken line, just the same. Same with drawing with a pencil, isn't it? Or painting with a paintbrush. You need to make the marks about what is there. Even if you don't copy them exactly, it doesn't really matter. But they, they need to be representing and about what you're doing. If you make a tram line around an object, it can be very nice in design, but it will flatten things out. And you really need to have... Um, an edge that is about the object that you're painting. Now when I remove this masking fluid I can tint the white marks back again. I don't have to leave them pure white so I can take them off in, at, at various times if I want to and put glazes over. Or I can wait until I've done most of the background and then lift them and tint over them then. So I've got several choices. Be careful you don't run your finger over um, and smudge an area that is still wet. You've got to let this dry completely before we paint. Remember, you cannot go on and paint while this is still wet unless you want it to blend in and also stick to your paper as well, which, uh, which it will do if you're not careful. 
watch out again another tip is watch out in hot weather because masking fluid does often tend to sink into the paper and it's difficult to get off if you let the um, masking fluid melt in heat sunshine especially um, is terrible I found that when painting in Egypt and I wrecked a whole painting because I simply couldn't get the masking fluid off after the sun had melted it into the paper it's some lovely textures Remember our armoury, we're always working light against dark, rough against smooth and warm against cool. If you get too much masking onto the um, blade or your brush, you can wipe it off or you can wash it off while it's still wet. And you can rub it off these rubber tools um, when it's dry, which is very useful. Whereas in ordinary brushes it tends to stick and it can make a real mess of your brushes. I'll jump ahead in a minute, I don't want to spend all day just showing you this. And I can be able to go, I'll be able to go on to my um, brushes in a moment I think. Just make sure I haven't got any more long thin ones to do. So I think that's about all of the long thin ones I need to do. I can carry on with the brush I think now. Right, I'll go down to my brush and we'll see if um, what that can do for the petals, see if the brush is better for the petals. Which we need to get these lovely light so of course this when I've used the ellipsis as I showed you to help make the um, the flowers get all the right shapes. So I'm just making little blobs now about the petal shapes. I'm not trying to copy them exactly, there's no point in that. We're making a painting, we're not doing a photograph, we're not reproducing it in its every detail. And some of the, these background colours can go on. Um, and be wet into wet so I'm going to not paint all of the flowers out I'm just painting out the most important light ones some of these lights are going to be which should paint over them afterwards which are tint you know, nothing nothing will be left or very little will be left absolutely white it's nearly all going to be tinted we want to get this effect of shadow as well we're going to have some of these flower heads away into the shadows and some of them out in the sunshine here I'm not doing all the flowers, as I say, because some of them are going to be just indicated as a wet into wet background. So they soften in and we have what we call lost and found edges. We have sharp edges and edges that just disappear into the background. And you can see now why I chose the, the blue masking fluid, I hope, because I can see what I'm doing. Well let's make a start on this teapot then, we're going to start in this area and I'm going to work on the teapot first of all, um, working wet into wet and wet next to wet, gently. Um, once that's done we'll go on to the flowers and the lighter blues and uh, working up the mid greens. So the first colour I want to start with is my lemon yellow. And on the top edge here, first of all. from directly onto the open edge of the paper. I'm going to paint wet next to wet and wet into the wet first of all. So I'm using lemon yellow. With another four round, with a number four round brush. Got a little bit of alizarin crimson to it now. And as it comes round the corner it gets a little bit redder, so I'm going to put a little bit of the bright red just around this edge here 
start to get a bit of a reflection of the reds coming in there. That's happening around here a bit as well. Just letting wet go into wet and gradually blend down. But the difference, the very the subtle difference between the bright red and the glycerin now. I want to use some water just to blend those colours in together so it's a soft edged blend down there. Letting that work just soften into the blue and yellow around there. Go for a wee touch of the turquoise now. I want some of that turquoise coming into this out here. Turquoise is a little bit the same as the um, grey of the masking fluid, so it's got to be it could get a little bit confusing. Just very thin coats at the moment as we blend this down. warm again. Let's have that warm come in here and just blend into that turquoise. This is the alizarin again, just blending in. Working mainly with the turquoise at the moment. And again clean water just to blend it in at the edge there. Right down to here. Quite thin coats at the moment. Just coming over that yellow transparently all the way around here. Warmer down there, just a moment. A little bit more of the brighter red to pick up into here. stronger as it comes down there. So I'm working wet into wet at the moment. I don't want to get hard edges yet, I just want these colours to blend one into another ever so gently. I could use a bigger brush for this now, but I just want to tickle these colours on. Let's build this up as if it's transparent glaze on this uh, teapot. Just gradually building up these colours wet into wet as they come around here. I'm going to add a touch now of the purple. Come under the deep purple. Get quite a bit darker with that in a minute, so I'm going to let that dry out quite a bit before I try and work into that much more. of light just showing there. That 
the deep purple just quite strong down around here. And we get more blue in it as well. So I'm adding a bit more pigment now into the wet into wet. Just letting it glow. Delicately letting that flow down here. The purple the mauve glow up into it. Now I need to go to my slightly warmer blue. I'm going to go to the ultramarine now. Start to glaze that in. Just drop it in with a wash here. Just want wet and wet effects at the moment. Playing the two together at the moment, the ultramarine and the and the purple. Just letting that blend in with clean water comes down through here. A lovely ultramarine blue. This is the French ultramarine blue. And the ordinary ultramarine is slightly greener than this, not quite as rich and royal blue as the French ultramarine is, as you can see. Just gradually building up and building up the wet into wet effects. And where the Deeper blue comes around here as well. Almost built it up enough, just a bit more. Just building up the sweat into wet of the ultramarine into here. Maybe a fraction of warmer with the alizarin coming on down through here. Every warmth just down this bit. This is the alizarin crimson now. Just putting a bit more warmth down into these areas here. We play one colour against another. Very, very delicate. Spending more time on the teapot because I, I want I want that to be the salient point, the most important, the focal point of the picture. And the rest is just going to be back round around it. Make that a bit stronger again, that uh, ultramarine blue down around here. Still building it up. I still want stronger blue down the bottom. So I can build up and build up and build up and as it dries I can soften it back and get more and more gentle if I want to. Lovely colour hues of the warms and cools of each colour. Where these flowers come it's quite almost pure colour just going into there 
just where the petals reflect. Look at those lovely effects we can get that way. Even when you shake a little bit of green and just add some of that green in there to reflect the plants and flowers around here especially and around that bit there too yellow again and a wee touch of the bright red into it to get an orange a little bit of the warmer colours going on now here I think I'm just about there with the teapot now. I've got all these lovely colours in I want and they're nice and soft in the right places. Let's blend that a little bit more there. When I take off the masking fluid we'll see these very light areas and it'll make more sense then. I just want to blend back a fraction on some of this here. Just to be slightly softer at the edges. Maybe a little bit stronger there in a moment. to go to Prussian quite yet there. Just a little bit of the blue again. Coming down on that shadow. I think, I think I'm about there now. It's got that lovely bit of shadow I wanted. I think our teapot doesn't look too bad. Just put a little bit of few dark, a few dark marks and shadows in there once it's dry because now I can put wet over dry. Once it's wet over dry we get a hard edge. Up until here I've just wanted soft edges, which is why I kept this as it is. Just lift a bit off there with the dry brush. Just lift a bit out. And blend a bit in here. There we are, we'll let that teapot stay at that for the moment. And we'll look at going on to the next parts of the flowers. And I want to do the very light blues first in the background of the flowers. And we've got some very light blues, turquoises and so up here, these lovely, very, very light blues going on. I can paint right across the wherever these light blue ones are. When I take the masking fluid off, I can put more of this light blue back on later if I need it. That's all we're going to be. You can hear it squeaking, the masking fluid actually squeaking on the brush. Strange effect and sound down through here. You can see where the masking fluid now is resisting it. I've got a slightly larger brush now. I'll go up to number eight. Those edges get lost together there. The business of lost and found edges, we're going to lose them just here and then find them again later. All of this can be quite turquoise blue just up here into the background. These edges just becoming lost and I shall find them again. Lost and found. They disappear and they come back. Now into that I need to start adding a bit more of this lovely violet, this purple violet. It's going on in the background. It's quite strong. I'm adding that into the the light blue I've just been doing. I've got the warmer blue to put in here yet as well. 
establish all of these beautiful warm cool hues going on back here so now let's go back to the ultramarine this is the SEA ultramarine not the Windsor & Newton so this one isn't going to granulate as much we'll start to get these lovely blues that are happening amongst this here much much deeper blues the heavier paint now is dropping in stronger colour, less water in it stronger colour as I come through here Light against dark, rough against smooth, warm against cool, keep the opposites going. At the moment we're playing the light against the dark more than the warm against the cool, aren't we? Just realised I need to zoom out because you can't see what I'm doing. At the top here, and I've worked up all of these turquoises then through to the mauves, then through to the ultramarine blue, now I'm just finishing off with at the moment getting these warm and cool hues of the blues going through here there we are, almost ready now to go on to the, on to the greens I think, I've got to start putting in these lovely light um, lemon yellows and greens up into here before I start doing the much darker um, colours around that. Well, let's just look now at the, at the yellows. We'll go back to the lemon yellow again. Do with washing my palette out. And we'll just look at these beautiful lemon yellows that are happening up into these areas. Start with our lights and work down to our darks. And this is one reason I wanted to use lemon yellow because with it being slightly more opaque, I can drop it into these blues and make a nice green. So at the same time as the bright yellow coming out and making sunshine, I'm also able to get a a nice mixture of green going on amongst it as well. As you can start to see now, I want it more yellow than this, you see. I still drop some greens into these as well. And that light, really light lemon yellow comes all the way down around here. into these parts here almost done those yellows as I wanted to get the bright yellows before I go in with the greens I could come back into some of those yellows with a bit of this turquoise because that would give me a lovely a lovely green look so a bit, a bit more turquoise into the green here and there by putting it into the yellows here luscious greens with this cobalt turquoise it's, it's, a, it's a lovely colour cobalt turquoise nice and these background leaves because I'm going to go dark and around and into this I want these background leaves to just be glowing through I 
have needed the other brushes yet at all, but some of you might have found it easier to use them by now. Bring some of that cobalt turquoise into the reflections of the teapot. Saving my big brush to the end in this case. Usually we go big brush down to small brushes. But in this case I've been going the other way around a bit. Again, just leaving those ghostly shapes behind and I want to go in there and over that again yet with a much deeper, warmer green. Just like these yellows to stand out in the background. I've yet to put the deep greens in and that would make a lot of difference as well. I've, I've used ultramarine until now as my darkest. I'm going to need to go darker still. In a minute I'm going to start using some Prussian into this. I'm just starting to get some of the darker tones to work against the other lighter ones so we've got rough against smooth and light against dark. Building it up with the French Ultramarine at the moment. Right, time to head towards some deeper greens. But to make a, a much deeper green we'll take our only green we've got. We'll add in with that a little bit of the blue just to start to get some of these lovely deep green shadows into this. We've got some greens already by the ones we've made with the turquoise and the yellow but I want to get a bit more of the deep greens going. There's some very, very darks in here as well that I want to pick up on yet. Go darker and darker and darker, but I don't want to go deader, just darker. There's such a difference between making something richer with colour than darker than actually killing it. I don't want to kill these lovely light colours. These white areas are masking fluid that are going to be tinted down later anyway. And I'm staying like this. Just starting to see the light coming out in it now as I build up these these deeper colours. The moment just the deep greens. coming with the darker and darker and darker colours. Right, we've got to start hitting some of the very very deep colours now around the outside edges. I could go up to a, a large mop. I'm going to stay with this one for the moment though, this number eight. And let's look at the Prussian blue. Beautiful deep blue. Let's see what we can do with that. With a little bit of indigo, I'm just going to make it a bit darker. And we've got really quite dark down in with that. Just suddenly go dark to bring out this teapot. my finger there just to bring that round. And that little tart piece inside the teapot. Got the lighter colours to withdraw yet, we've got to take off got to 
take out the bits of um, masking fluid yet, of course, which will make a lot of difference. Still painting wet into wet. Just finding some of the darks now. See how the teapot is now standing out, starting to catch the light. A crisscross here a bit to make the texture. Keep a little purple into it to make a foreground here of fraction. Just starting to see our picture take shape, I think, more now. Some lovely darks to go in the back here. Beautiful, rich darks, which I want sort of wet into wet, so I'll plonk them into here and I'll get a bit of water back in and we'll blend them back again a bit. We're working very loosely, wet into wet, and gradually coming down towards our details at the end when I'll be painting the wet over the dry and bringing out details of this. So we're almost now at the stage ready to remove the masking fluid. A few more warms amongst some of this, just to bring it forward. I'm putting a little bit of the Alistair Crimson in with some of the green to make a brown. Just a bit of warmth going on in the foreground here to bring the eye, to lead the eye in amongst all these cools. Now all these little bits of grey, gluey, white are going to be coming out in a moment and we'll be putting pure colour back into those. You see what I meant about the rough and the smooth, but the smooth qualities of the wet and wet into wet here. And then as we come out, we're gradually putting the wet onto dry areas, which is going to make a lot sharper edges. Just warm the darks. I'm adding some this one crimson now down into the Prussian blue to give me some really, really lovely darks here. I think I want to put it dry now and see if we can get the masking fluid off and then we'll see what's happening after that. Well, now we come to the part where we hope and pray that the masking fluid will come off. I usually use a, a handkerchief or a cloth for masking fluid, it tends to bring it off easier. And as you can see now, look at how that comes off with a cloth. And suddenly you get slow, suddenly you get all the white areas with sharp edges that we used the blue masking fluid on earlier. And now we can tint those with the watercolours to get are perfect hues and tones and shades. So I've got to get all of this off first. And it's going to look a bit stark at the beginning until I actually go into it and um, put the colours down. You can see what I've put it around the teapot and everything now. And once you can see where I haven't put it as well, which is just as important. So all of these areas have to be tinted down now. Delicately with watercolour. There we go. That's the masking fluid off and that's how it should come off. 
It don't always happen because, uh, as I say, sometimes if you let it get too hot in the sun, it will just soak into the paper. You just can't get it off, so be very careful about that. There we go then. That's ready now to be, be tinted and completed. Right, we're on to the last stages of this in one day. And the first thing we want to do is to tint down the, the flowers here in the background, leaving some very light, some just tinted down. So I'm using some very, very light turquoise first of all, just to just to tint these down. Even here a little, I'll tint it down a little bit. Might need a little bit more dark around some of these as well yet. See how it takes it down, it softens it straight away into what we want. And just delicately bring any colours that are very light down a bit. If they're too stark at the moment just to delicately shine. And we've got pure, pure yellows on the amongst the flowers here. We can really start to bring these little bits of colour out now, nice and clean and pure. Linking the colours around, just blend them in. And you can see why I wanted these nice sharp edges now. We've got lovely clean bits of leaf coming up there amongst these now. You can see why the masking fluid, I think, now. Well, we used it. When I first took the masking fluid off, I thought, what? That's not going to work. Hopefully now you can see that it should work. And being lemon yellow, we can paint it over the tops of these colours just a little bit to bring out any lighter greens that we want in places as well. Because uh, it's slightly more opaque, we're able to do that. So I can take it a little bit more thickly now and look and just over the tops of these bits here, bringing out these leaves. So if I bring a bit of that yellow in there, it just gives it that little bit more of a green tint, doesn't it? Bring these down too. I can bring the turquoise across these to make them more green in a minute. So that we start to get the sunshine. I'm talking about green, let's take some of our hookers green and mix that with some of the yellow, which will give us a slightly warmer, darker green. And we'll just start to tint some of these green areas in. So lemon yellow and some hookers green just to bring back these colours a little bit a bit too bright at the moment. We are starting to feel the sunshine now, the advanced sunshine coming down into here. Hookers green again. We're going to put a little bit of ultra in with that now. Make it a little bit more of the blue or green. Take it down a bit darker still amongst these lovely shades here. So that's the hooker's green and a bit of French ultramarine just to give us a slightly deeper, richer green up into here amongst these lovely lights. I haven't finished with the turquoise yet. Let's 
still want a little bit of that cool coming into these. Amongst these warms as well. Down here. We'll have some more blue in there in a minute too, a bit more pink and, and the, um, the ultramarines coming in. But I also want it to be quite cool in shadow there. When we take the white out and start to get these colours in, it starts to make more sense. So, almost got our lights done, let's go back now to our ultramarine, that beautiful ultramarine we've got and we'll start to lay in a bit more of that into the, into the warms maybe even a little bit of purple here and there, we'll see got beautiful colours going on down in here we need to find those colours now take a bit of the this friend and just come back in a bit of warmth amongst these blues to bring them out. We're almost there, you know. Don't want to overdo it. It's always very easy to overdo a, a watercolour, as most of you will know. Very useful colour. And we're playing one colour against another, we're playing warms against cools, lights against darks and of course, as we said earlier, the rough against the smooth to really bring out these beautiful effects. Now we can just start to pick up in the individual flowers a bit. That's where these petals, the darks and lights are in between and other petals. And have we almost got enough detail? We don't want to overwork it. It's a very busy picture anyway, that we know, but... There, you know, I think we're just about done. It could become overworked if we're not careful, so I think we'll, we'll stop there. Just a few directional marks going on around these petals. Last touches. I just feel we need a little bit of more red here and there. So these shapes. Just to make the blues sing a little bit more. Textural piece, and uh, I hope you all enjoy having a go at it.